Well, good morning. Thank you for uh, being here at Brookside, and uh, we're excited to, to have you here today. It's always a, a wonderful service when we're having baptisms, and uh, we have three in the first service, three in the second service, and so they'll start right at the beginning of the service, so uh, if you want to pop in and hear the uh, second service before you go to Bible study, feel free to do that. But anyway, we're thankful for uh, these young men that are wanting to uh, follow the Lord in baptism, and so... I'm going to have Jariah Gill, if he would come up first. So this is uh, Jariah Gill, and, uh, and uh, Jariah, what, what grade are you in? I'm a senior. Senior in high school. And so, uh, Jariah, you know for sure you're, you're on your way to heaven? Absolutely, sir. All right. Well, thank you. Why don't you share... Uh, how uh, you uh, uh, came to the Lord, all right? No, go ahead. Although I grew up in a Christian home and was constantly around the gospel, God really got my attention in the fourth grade. While I was reading my literature book, I came across a story that puzzled me. The story was about a mom and her son who were barely getting by, but several times in the story, the mother kept on telling the son that they, can, that they needed to continually rely on God to provide for that, their needs, and God continually provided for them. After reading that story, I remember coming to my mom, telling her about that story, and asking her what the story meant when it kept saying that the family was continually relying on God to provide for them. My mother then began to tell me the full story of God and man. She told me about man's falling out with God in the Garden of Eden, how sin entered into the world through that, and God's coming judgment against sin. She then told me about God's son Jesus, who came to earth, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross for everyone's sins. She explained how we are saved by God's grace and how we can't get to heaven by doing good works. I remember after our conversation going to a private part of our home and giving my life to Christ and accepting him as my savior. Amen. And uh, so Jeray and then his brother Luca here in a moment is going to be baptized. Uh, family and friends that are here to watch uh, uh, Jeray and Luca, raise your hand there. Good to have you all. Thank you for being here. And, uh, And so uh, before Jariah is baptized, he's asked his father, uh, Wilson Gill, if he would uh, pray for him. So, Wilson, if you'd pray at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the faith and continued obedience in Jariah. We pray, Lord, that as he continues to grow, that this additional step of obedience would pave the way for many, many more. Lord, we ask that you would continue to look out for him and uh, guide him through the many phases that life will uh, ultimately take, but that he would never lose sight of the precious gift of salvation that you gave him uh, many years ago as he seeks to follow in baptism today. In Jesus' name, amen. Jariah, based on your uh, public profession of faith in Christ Jesus alone to save you from your sins, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Remember, the, uh, the water has nothing to do with anyone's salvation. It's all about the identification with Christ, and we want to continually remind folks uh, of that. So, uh, Luca, you come on up now. This is Jariah's brother. Burying all... Uh, we're, Baptizing all these big uh, teens today, so uh, I'm trying not to get a double blessing. <laughs> all right, Luca, good to have you. you uh, you're 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? Yes. All right, why don't you share with our folks how you came to know Christ? Okay. Growing up in a Christian home, I was no stranger to the gospel. I had heard about how Jesus died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and rose again but I never really took the consequences of rejecting Jesus seriously until I watched a film with my family called A Thief in the Night. It is about the rapture and the punishment of God on the unsaved. Although I was challenged by this film, I still put off submitting to Jesus Christ, preferring to live my life for myself. But God was not done pursuing me. Years later, around the age of 12 or 13, I heard a convicting message from Adrian Rogers on the radio. I was convicted by how meaningless life is without Christ, and at the end of the sermon, when he gave the invitation to receive Jesus, I accepted it. I prayed and asked God to forgive my sins and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. 
But until now, I still have never followed the Lord in baptism. Although baptism is not necessary for salvation, it is necessary to obedience. And desiring to be obedient to Christ, I now publicly identify myself with him in his death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. Amen. So, uh, Jariah, thank you for that. How, how many of you have, had a, have listened to uh, Adrian Rogers' uh, message that was convicting to you? All right. <laughs> You raised your hand maybe a little too soon for me to put that <laughs> convicting part on there, but uh, I'm sure we all I'm sure we all have. So Luca, um, thank you so much. Tremendous testimony, and we look forward to what God's going to do in your life. And again, your father uh, Wilson's going to pray for you before you're baptized. Our heavenly Father, once again we thank you for Luca. We thank you for his life. We thank you for your influence over his decisions. We thank you, Lord, for the clear understanding of the gospel. We thank you for bringing him unto yourself. As he continues to age in this life, we pray that you would put boundaries in front of him that he can only climb and clear by your grace. We ask that he would be faithful to the call. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Luca, thank you, and for your uh, public profession of faith in Christ alone to save you from your sins, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. All right, Nate Muse, Nate Muse. Nate Grooms, Nate Muse is our missionary. Uh, <laughs> Nate Grooms is a junior uh, and uh, been here at Brookside for a while. Uh, family and friends here for uh, Nate. All right. Uh, a few, you got a few more friends there in the back, okay. Right. So, uh, Nate, uh, you 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? Yes, I am. Why don't you share with our folks how your journey of faith with Christ began? I've always grown up in a Christian household talking about Jesus all the time. But when I was younger, I thought that I would be saved through good works. One night when I was younger, I was about six or seven years old. I remember talking to my dad in my bedroom at night, asking how I could get saved and go to heaven. I remember hearing that I was a sinner and needed God's help. And my dad read some scripture from John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, for whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We talked about God's free gift for us, that God died on the cross for my sins, and that night I put my faith and trust in Jesus. That's, that is why I'm getting baptized, because I wanted to publicly profess that Jesus is my Savior. Since being saved, I've learned to put away flesh and worldly things. I continue to grow in His Word, and through everything I do from daily life to sport, I aim to always give God the glory. Amen. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to how God's going to continue to use you, Nate. And so Nate's asked his father, Paul, to uh, pray before he's baptized here. Um, uh, father, I thank you for Nathaniel and he being willing to follow your command to be baptized. Knowing that baptize, baptism does not save anyone, but only an outward expression of an inward commitment. We are so very thankful and privileged with the opportunity to see you at work in his life. I ask for your hand to bless and to guide Nathaniel each moment of the day to be obedient, a desire to grow, to walk by faith and not by sight, and to share your truth with others along the journey. In Jesus' name. Nate, upon your public profession of faith in Christ Jesus alone to save you from your sins, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Well, we're really thankful for these that uh, are willing to follow the Lord in baptism. And uh, I hope that when you see them around today, you'd be able to just give them a word of encouragement and say, hey, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, there's nothing like it hearing how folks came to know Jesus Christ personally. So if you need to follow the Lord in baptism, see us. We'd love for you to take that step of obedience. Brian. I do love baptism Sundays here at Brookside, and I love hearing the testimonies, but it reminds me of what a great God we serve. And so let's please stand and sing, Behold Our God.
that's why we're here today. If you're visiting with us today, uh, we are very thankful for you coming. And there's a card in the uh, back of the chair in front of you. Uh, if you would fill that out for us and leave it at the info desk in the lobby, uh, we'd love to pray for you during the week, and uh, they have a gift that they would like to give you. Uh, so, uh, but again, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this Saturday, if you're interested in finding out more about the church and looking to pursue membership, the Keltners are having a uh, membership class at their house at 9.30. Uh, see the office to uh, get more information with that. In your bulletin, you have a flyer uh, about the Faith Baptist Bible College choir that's going to be here on uh, March 10th. And we're looking to house them uh, while they're here on Sunday evening. You might assume it's Saturday evening, but they'll be here just in the evening. And Sunday evening, uh, we're looking to house them, and you'll find full details of that in the uh, uh, flyer that you have there. If you're uh, interested in the Israel trip in 2025, um, that trip is uh, being put back in motion by the people that are uh, planning the trip and uh, uh, guides and so forth. Um, and uh, the first uh, payment uh, is due on March 8th. And um, so uh, we uh, look forward to that time. And if uh, you are able to go on the trip, it'll be just a life-changing trip for you. Uh, teens and parents who are interested in finding out more about the mission trip to the Dominican Republic this summer, uh, today at 1130 in the teen room, there's a information meeting with that. And then children can be dismissed to Children's Church after the choir sings today. In our next song, in the first verse, there are lyrics that say that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. As we have baptisms today and we're reminded that that is not an act of salvation, but it is an act of obedience, these words came to my mind. Let's please stand and sing, Speak, O Lord.
the ushers are going to come to receive the offering for today. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness both to uh, what you give for the uh, general offering at the church, but also for our missionaries uh, all around the world. And uh, we uh, uh, just pray that uh, we'll continue to uh, support heavily uh, the mission efforts uh, everywhere. Our missionary of the week is local uh, here in Milwaukee. Uh, it's Alpha Women's Center, and uh, Jesse and I uh, got to go there a couple weeks ago and meet Sue. Holly Hickey is the director. We might pray for her specifically. She's been, as many of you know, battling cancer uh, for the last couple of years. Um, so uh, we want to pray for them. And then our shut-in of the week, James and Judy Strobel, and uh, please pray for them. Um, We'll mention a couple people in prayer, but uh, one specifically is uh, young uh, Unalea, who is uh, the granddaughter of Doug Poe. She's in the hospital uh, this weekend at Children's Hospital, and they're running some tests and so forth with uh, potential surgery coming uh, uh, quickly. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are very, very thankful for all that we have. We come here today to honor you, to worship you, and Father, may we have hearts that very freely express our gratitude and our uh, worship of you. Uh, Father, we're thankful for the word that you give us, and today, as we just sang, would you use your word to speak to our hearts. And uh, Father, we pray that you'll be with uh, the Women's Center, uh, be with Holly and Sue and the other volunteers who are there. Uh, Father, uh, that each day there might be uh, lives of uh, unborn babies that will be rescued. And uh, Father, that uh, uh, mothers will be brought to a saving faith in you. Father, be with uh, uh, Jim and Judy Strobel and pray that you will give them the grace and the strength, all the resources and provision that they need for the day. Uh, Father, we're very thankful that Unalea is receiving such great care. Uh, but Father, uh, beyond the machinery and the wisdom of nurses and doctors, uh, far beyond that is the ability that you have to uh, guide her life and to meet her needs. And Father, we pray that you would give uh, extra wisdom to these uh, uh, technicians that, Father, they would have your guiding hand and a wisdom that is even beyond themselves uh, to be able to meet her needs. We pray this week you be with Lori Blumel. And, Father, uh, this particular week is full of procedures and tests and appointments for her. And, Father, may they all work together for uh, her healing. Father, be with Ken Krieger uh, this week uh, with hand surgery. We ask your blessing on him. Uh, Father, we pray that you'd be with Joanne Zuba, uh, who is uh, um, uh, feeling uh, rough and under the weather today, and would you meet her as well. Uh, Father, we are very, very thankful again for all of your provisions, and we ask your kindness today in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning, folks. Before I get to our scripture reading uh, this morning, I thought I'd just take a moment just to point out some special guests that are here with us this morning. One of them being my cousin, who I haven't seen in 10 years. Can you believe that? Over 10 years. Uh, she came from Arizona, along with her is her friend, uh, Tamisha. Uh, if you could just wave your hand, that, that's my cousin. Uh, and then <laughs> there with her is her friend, Leandria. They both came uh, here for the weekend. Uh, and just to uh, point out something funny in our time uh, of being together was, uh, I took them around downtown, being the local that I am, showing them around. Uh, <laughs> and as I was taking them around, uh, three different times we kept passing the Brewers Stadium, and I realized I was lost. Uh, and it's funny because Tamisha, she joked around and she said, each time we're passing the Brewers Stadium, it's like we're getting closer. Uh, when that, that, that wasn't the intention, but uh, it was a great time altogether. We, we really enjoyed it. They're going to be leaving out tomorrow, so just uh, pray for safety as they make their way back to Arizona. But it's just been great being with, uh, with family once again. Um, but there's that. So back to our scripture reading, we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 148, verses 1 through 14, just before the preaching. And this is what God's word says to us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, of you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, king of the earth and all peoples, princes and all the judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and he has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you, Jesse, and... uh... Aren't we thankful we serve a God of order? He's the creator, ordered it all. Let me uh, invite you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And uh, we're going to really work hard on trying to close out this chapter this morning as, as we look at this final section of Paul dealing with spiritual gifts in verses 26 through 40. I believe that we can cover this, uh, this larger section of Scripture because it's, it's very simple, it's very straightforward, practical information, and I uh, do trust the Spirit of God will be able to use it here in our last discussion of the truth about spiritual gifts, specifically of tongues and prophecy. If you've been with us for any time, you know that Paul has been confronting some problems there in the Corinthian church, and this problem is uh, that he's dealing with in chapter 14 uh, revolves around the confusion within the public worship service, and he wants there to be order in the church, and thus our title of our message this morning is Order in the Church. I'm sure whether you uh, watch some of those old Perry Mason uh, reruns or whatever, or you've watched uh, Judge Judy with uh, court trial uh, you have probably, or maybe you've been present uh, in a courtroom at one time, you've watched possibly the judge hit the gavel and say, I want order in the court. Unfortunately, I was really the cause of that particular scene in the Arvada City Court in Colorado. I had been uh, summoned to be there in court because I was being charged with barking dog. The teens in our youth group had actually given us a dog one Christmas, and uh, that was interesting, but one of our neighbors up the road did not like to hear any dogs barking. Eventually, he called the police, and we were summoned to appear in court. And uh, as I was called to the podium, I was told that I was in violation of Article 5, Section 12 of the city's municipal code by the judge. The judge then stopped and visited a little bit with the court clerk, and she told him what the charge was. 
And he came back, and when he understood that, he said, Mr. Keltner, you are in violation of the city code, and you are charged with barking dog. Now, mind you, there were a group of men that were going to wait their time to be in front of the judge, and they were in handcuffs. <laughs> and when they heard that charge against me, they all just broke out in this uncontrollable laughter. And the judge was not pleased by that reaction, and he took his gavel and he screamed, I want order in this court. And then he looked at me, and I'll never forget these words. He said, Mr. Keltner, you must think this is funny. I replied, Your Honor, I'm not laughing. Everyone else here is laughing. I'm not laughing. I don't think it's a laughing matter. I'm having to take time away from my family, and I'm having to take time away from my responsibilities at the church to be here this afternoon. Well, to make a, a very long ordeal very short, several weeks later it was determined it was a bogus charge and the charge was dropped. But the city has rules, right? They want us to obey the rules. We have rules in the land. And I don't know about you, but most of us really don't like rules, but they're necessary, especially if you're in a group setting. I, lear I learned years ago that you cannot function as a corporate body without some rules. For instance, a baseball game is a lot more fun if you keep the rules. Uh, driving in traffic works a lot better if rules are kept and people follow them. I know because I've been in Eastern Africa where at times they drive as if there were no rules. So really, folks, people benefit when there's order. And God has laid down some rules for the church, and the first church of Corinth is exhibit A of what God has to say concerning the public assembly while worshiping him. Now, the key to this section of scripture is the word edification or edify. In this chapter, it's going to appear many, many times. You'll remember in chapter 14, verse 3, it talks about edification. In verse 4, edifying the church. In verse 5, that the church may receive edifying. Verse 12, that the church may be edified. And in verse 19, that I might teach others also. And then here, beginning in verse 26, comes the sum of it all. Let all things be done unto edifying. So in a spiritual sense, it means that I want to build someone up in their faith. Like a person starts uh, to build their home, they build it, they start with a foundation to build the house. So the church has, as its intention and design, the building up of the saints into full completeness. It means to promote spiritual growth, to develop the character of a believer to the place of, of spiritual maturity in their life. I mean, that's where God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be as infants spiritually. He wants us to keep growing. And Paul's principle will be seen as we progress through to the end of this chapter. And here is the principle. If believers want to learn and grow, then edification requires orderliness. Without orderliness, there will not be the edification of the believers to the truth of God's word. So it brings us to this problem that he was dealing with because what evidently was taking place in the Sunday services at Corinth was anything but orderly. There was disorderliness in their worship. Now I'm sure the worship services there in Corinth were anything but dull. It's unlikely that you would have drifted off to sleep if you were attending one of their services because it was almost like a scene of, of constant emotional activity. In fact, Paul concluded it was so much out of control activity that it was in a very distorted state and that could actually lead to some very damaging results and that's why he deals with it. So here he comes to the final discussion of spiritual gifts which we have covered for a long period of time now, chapters 12, 13, and 14. Those three chapters are a unit that go together, and now he sums it up by identifying what is wrong in the way in which they gather together to worship the Lord. And I do believe that we're going to see it in our text this morning. It has a great deal of relevance today for the church. So look with me at the final verse of chapter 14, where Paul writes in verse 40, 
let all things be done decently and in order. And again, Paul knows that the edification, the building up of the body of believers will not occur unless there is order in the church. Paul's going to lay out for us four specific governing rules, and then he's going to conclude in the last four verses by reminding us that God is a God of rules. First of all, we see in verse 26, the first rule is for edification, for edifying. And it's as if Paul here, in asking this question, kind of begins with just a a tone of despair. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation? Uh, Look at the problem here, then we'll see what, what the solution is with this rule. It gives us a portrait here of what their worship was really like. It possibly could be that he's even addressing if they were meeting in smaller groups or a smaller home type of meeting. Uh, where it invited more group participation. It certainly wasn't that a psalm or a teaching or the other things listed here were wrong. In fact, when properly used, all of these items that he's mentioned are great aspects of edification. They're very good. But the freedom that they had in the worship had been allowed to get out of control. It wasn't that some particular person said, hey, I I have this song that I want to sing. No, rather it was that everyone had their own song they wanted to sing. And they were all singing it, usually all at once. It wasn't that someone had some teaching to offer, but rather everyone had some teaching to offer, and they were offering it all at the same time. And several people were actually declaring the interpretation of this or that. And so you get the picture, it was just totally utter chaos and confusion. Can I tell you, Satan loves to bring chaos and confusion into the church. I mean, there's no church that's immune to it. I mean, you you hear all the time of something that happened during a worship service. I remember back in Tulsa, I was getting ready to open up the the service with the choir, and, and one of the ladies in the front row said, no, and she went running down, and I had teens sitting in the front, and two teens got up in the right at the beginning of the service and started duking it out, throwing punches at each other. I mean, uh, what a great way to have a call to worship, you know. Here we go. I mean, confusion and chaos, Satan loves for it. In fact, the mystery religions of the Roman Empire, which were flourishing around the time of Christ, also practiced this ecstatic speaking. They had these huge emotional events. So worship in Corinth, my friends, had some serious issues, and Paul said, I need to address these. Warren Wiersbe's comment here I thought was very good. Let me quote it for you. He says they were having special problems with disorder in their public meetings, and the reason is not difficult to determine, he said. They were using their spiritual gifts to please themselves and and not to help their brethren. And the key word, he said, was not edification, but exhibition. Friends, when we come together to worship, we shouldn't make it our priority to ask, well, hey, what can I get out of church today? I mean, what are they going to do for me? Instead, the first thing we really need to be asking is, God, what is it that you want for me today? And then ask, and God, how can I serve my brother or my sister in church? When we come wanting to minister and to contribute into the lives of others, I'm going to tell you, you'll always receive the greater blessing. But when we want to do our own thing all at the same time, you can see how things are going to actually get out of order very quickly. Here was the rule. Let all things be done for edification. When we share the word or when we're ministering or when, even when we're fellowshipping with folks, our, our goal should be to build others up, not tear people down. Paul basically is saying here, if it doesn't edify or make some worthwhile contribution to the spiritual welfare of other believers, then just drop it. What's it doing? Incidentally, in his list of gifts here in verse 26, this is the fourth time that tongues and the interpretation of tongues has been put last in the list of four gifts. In chapters 12, 13, and 14, a unit, there are four lists of spiritual gifts, and every time tongues and the interpretation of tongues appears last. 
And the reason for that should be pretty obvious by now. Paul considered that particular gift to be less edifying. He's already encouraged the Corinthians, uh, and when we started chapter 14, to seek prophecy or the proclamation of the word. And it's interesting, in light of that, what we see today. Some folks have distorted this biblical emphasis here because they have ignored this all-important principle that all things are to be done for the edification of others and not self-gratification. Hopefully today, you and I will actually make a spiritual contribution in the lives of another person. And so Paul is going to lay down some rules, particularly for the two gifts that he wants to address, and the first being rules for tongues. And Paul's going to give three simple limits to help govern the exercise of, of the biblical gift of tongues. And again, we've talked about it in the past, of a known language. Here it is. The first, in verse 27, limitation on numbers. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most, three. In other words, if anyone is going to speak in a language not known by the, the, the majority of people there, in a service, the maximum in any one service is for three people. That's the rule. I don't know if you've ever noticed a religious program on the television, and maybe it's a very emotional type program uh, of, of a church service, and you see them all begin to pray, and they all begin to pray at the same time. In fact, it's kind of normal procedure at some charismatic churches to pray all at the same time. And then various people will actually break out into uh, this uh, tongue language, is many times just an ecstatic utterance, and it's in direct violation of what we read right here in the first part of verse 27. And that may be what the Corinthians actually were doing. I used to uh, watch some charismatic religious TV programs when I was there in Tulsa, and the preacher would be getting the people all worked up. He'd be, see, he'd be saying things like, hey, folks, I'm going to tell you right now, what we saw the other night was phenomenal. Seven to 800 people were just slain in the spirit. And there were hallelujahs, and there was all kinds of good things happening. And they were beginning to wave their arms, seven, eight hundred slain in the spirit, and they fell all straight flat down on the ground. God knocked them flat. And then he would always say, I wish 2,000 of you would get zapped the same way. And he said, and in that same night, 1,500 people began to speak in tongues. Uh-oh. Based on our text this morning, that's... Uh, 1,500 people is only 1,497 too many. There may have been many who attended this church at Corinth from other countries, and they spoke different language, languages. If two or three stood up to actually speak, and if they had an interpreter, that could take a long time. I've been places where I've been speaking in English, and I have an interpreter. They like to say an interrupter because it takes twice as long. So Paul's saying, if it is going to happen, it's only two and at the most three. Secondly, there's a limitation on order. Notice the phrase there in verse 27, each in turn. In other words, they cannot try to all speak at the same time. Isn't that interesting when you're watching, um, you know, some sort of a news uh, live news scenario and, and you got one person trying to answer questions and you got 15 out there trying to ask them all at one time? No, he's saying you have to speak in order. And again, often in some of these services, many are praying in tongues out loud at the same time and it just doesn't fit the guidelines that God's laid out as a rule in his word. Then there's a limitation on format in verses 20, end of 27 and 28. And he said, and let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. The rule was clear and simple. No interpreter, no speaking out. I remember Dan Felt telling me years ago at Elmbrook when Stuart Briscoe was preaching, all of a sudden someone just stood up and started speaking in tongues. Pastor Stuart Briscoe stopped and he asked, is there anyone here can interpret what this person is saying? No one stood up. And he looked at the, that one and said, would you kindly sit back down? No interpreter. Speakers in a foreign tongue had to also find out, is there someone who could interpret for me? 
before they spoke. The phrase, let him speak to himself and to God, implies that of meditation, contemplation. It was a silent prayer in their, in their own heart, in their own soul to, to God. And yet there are those in charismatic circles who will use verse 28 as a proof text to use the, the argument that tongues can be used in private prayer. And I would just simply say, friend, look at the context here. The context is not dealing with private prayer. The context here is dealing with the addressing of the public worship assembly. It has nothing to do with any kind of private prayer language. So as you can see, Paul counts orderly, orderliness in worship as a must. Notice now Paul will give rules for prophecy in verses 29 to 33. And the rules for prophecy, there's a limitation on number. Same rule as before with tongues. Notice here he says in verse 29, let two or three prophets speak. Now since the completion of scripture, prophecy has no longer been the means of I'm revealing some new revelation. But it only proclaims what has already been revealed, and that's what's been revealed in this book. And so uh, the gift of prophecy is the spirit-given, spirit-empowered ability to proclaim the word of God effectively. And so that's what Paul is emphasizing. He's addressing it here. You could say there's a time limitation because prophecy, uh, preaching, can be much longer in time than one just speaking in tongues. And listen, I know we preachers have a tendency to get a little long-winded. And a close friend of mine who usually is here uh, will always say, uh, <laughs> and I can notice it. We have time constraints here at Brookside. I know I'm not perfect in this area, forgive me. But I do know I can't go too long, or next week I will have the clock of shame hung around my neck. <laughs> so let's quickly move on. Limitation on acceptance, verse 29, and let the others judge. This is very interesting. In other words, let the other prophets or preachers pass judgment. So before God's word was finalized in its entirety, it was difficult for believers to actually judge, is what he's telling me truth or not. And other prophets that were there with the gift of discernment, they could make and they would make that judgment. They would either confirm the revelation that was being shared or they would reject it. For us now, we can judge by the word because you can look at it yourself. We have the privilege of having God's word. It's been preserved for us. And you can see from the text if I'm telling the truth. If not, you have all right to come in and to question me. Please do it after the service, though. Limitation on order, verses 30 to 33. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints." Just as in the rule for tongues, prophets were also to speak in turn in order to, to, again, assure that the services were orderly. Now, if there was another prophet sitting by and he received a revelation from God, this is what was taking place there in the church at Corinth in that first century, the first prophet could kind of get the attention of the one speaking like there is something that God's shown me. And Paul is saying, then the one speaking first should then sit down. In other words, don't dominate the service, let the other one speak. And he says, because all may learn and all may be encouraged. And friends, I trust, that's why you're here today, that we might all learn and that we might all be encouraged. The prophet, though, is to actually control his own spirit in order not to contribute any confusion to the assembly. In verse 33, he says it again, God is not the author of confusion. Confusion is a very strong word, and it pictures a great disturbance. My friends, where there is confusion with a group of believers, you will find the absence of God. Listen, more than one church has been 
turned into a battleground by fleshly self-willed people who insist on having their own way rather than considering the good of others and the welfare of the entire church. And my friends, God puts a huge, a high premium on peace among believers as we see written right here for us in verse 33. Now Paul moves now to the rule of submission. It underscores the orderliness of men and women. Remember, we're still in the context of public worship services in the church, and Paul now returns to a subject that he dealt with back in chapter 11 in some length. And I can tell you, it's one of the hottest issues in our day, and in speaking about it is one of the best ways to get people upset with me. But ladies and gentlemen, it is a part of God's word. We can't ignore it. Here's the rules for submission. Limitation with what women can say and do. Look at verses 34 and 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for, a, for women to speak in church. It is this passage that has caused some to write off the Apostle Paul regarding him as some ignorant male chauvinist. And that attitude really ignores the heart of the Apostle Paul because there are scenes in Scripture of Paul traveling with certain men and women in a small group who helped him in the work of the ministry. And ladies, let me just say right up front, there is not a problem with a, men, with a woman and, and the opportunity to minister within the church. Paul is simply providing some biblical instruction here concerning women judging prophecy and disruptive speaking. So we need to take what Paul wrote here in light of several facts in the early church regarding men and women. First, men and women are created equal as equal heirs to the promises of God. You find that in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. Secondly, women had significant ministry roles in the early church. Paul spoke of that in Romans 16. Uh, where he's thanking many of the women for their ministry within the local body. Third, in the early church, there were prophetesses who obviously engaged in prophetic ministry. I mean, even in today, uh, women teaching women the word of God. Fourth, women were permitted to pray and prophesy under the proper authority of their husbands. And that's what you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, especially in verse 5. The problem in 1 Corinthians 11 was a group of evangelical feminists who had forgotten that God was an order of authority. I mean, Paul had indicated that some of the women had abandoned their head coverings, which in the city of Corinth, that was showing a woman was under submission to her husband. That's not what it shows today, but that's what it was showing then. And so it was a sign by these women that they indeed did not appreciate the leadership that God had actually instituted as far as his order. Thus, here in Corinth, they were not only creating dissension, but it was actually a shameful situation. And this is what was Paul's big concern. You have to see that both in the Jewish and Greek cultures of that day, men had regulated women to a, very, to a lesser position. But women in Christ had actually been set free. And now they were going, unfortunately, overboard. And so Paul reminded the church that God still has an order of authority. God the Father is first. You can look back at chapter 11 and see this. Followed by God the Son, who willingly submitted to the authority of God the Father. Then man is to be su submissive to Christ Jesus and and, and woman was to be submissive to man. That is God's order of authority. I didn't come up with that. I'm just delivering the mail. It has nothing to do with dignity or worth or equality. We all have dignity, worth, and equality as human beings, for we have all been made in the image of God. It has to do with relationship and responsibility, and that is the issue that Paul is addressing. But again, some of these facts back in the early church, uh, in, in, in considering it in light of verses 34 and 35, is that for God's own purposes, he has appointed men 
to serve in the authoritative role of elders or pastors, those primarily responsible for leading, teaching, and preaching. So you might say, well, Pastor Ken, do you say that women preachers are going against Scripture? I would say, read it for yourself. I would say that's, that's correct. But he also says women were not to teach or exercise authority over a man in 1 Timothy chapter 2, but to remain quiet during the time, this is important, during the time of the public address of Scripture. So this rule of remaining silent doesn't apply to all public address situations. Can we have a woman come up and actually share her testimony? Absolutely. But when it comes more to the pulpit ministry, we could say, that's kind of the official function of a preaching pastor, it seems here in Corinth that some of the women in the assembly were creating problems during the worship by going on ahead and interrupting and asking questions and speaking out. And Paul in verse 35 reminds that the married women are to be submissive to their husbands and to get their questions answered at home. But you need to understand, in fact, in that day, probably men sit on one side and women sit on the other. So it was really impossible for a, a, a wife to whisper into her husband's ear, you want to check on that? I mean, she couldn't do that. She's over on the, on the far side. And so we can also assume that the unmarried women could counsel with the elders or with other men in their own families. So the law was referring, uh, when it says it, it's of the law, there in verse 34, it's probably going back into the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 16 would be one. But then, uh, responsibilities of men here, it's, kinda, it's implied. It appears here that the major responsibility for doctrinal purity in the early church rested on the shoulders of men. Elders in particular, and I think it's sad to say in the 21st century that in many churches even and in many homes, it's the women who take the role, who have the heartbeat to want to wanna see uh, growth in their own spiritual life and the growth of others. And many times it's the women who are better taught in the word. And so, man, we have a responsibility to be spiritual leaders in our own home and then be actively involved in the leadership of the local church. And so finally, God does have a set of rules in verses 36 to 40. Notice there's a, he's the source of order in divine authority, the reception of God's word. Verses 36 to 38, Paul here is writing tongue in cheek here a little bit. I mean, it's completely satire. He says, or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are commandments of the Lord. So Paul is saying, I have been inspired to write this. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. In other words, if he's ignorant, just ignore him with whatever they're saying. He's asking, do you Corinthians think you're the only church that has the truth? I mean, it's pretty sarcastic, isn't it? Paul wants them to see just how foolish it is to act as though they're so superior to every other body of believers. And unfortunately, we see some of this today. People who believe that they have direct authority from God and they will even set the scripture aside in order that they can give their opinion or their experience. Often you'll hear them say, I don't care what the Bible says because I had this experience and I know it was real. Or they'll say, well, this is just the way I feel about it, and that's more important to me than what the Bible actually says. Can I tell you, when you're basing a lot of what you're wanting to do on your feelings, you are going to get in trouble. That's why God has given us his word to look at, because I don't always feel like doing certain things. But if you are around people and that's how they're talking, I'd say watch out. Watch out for that attitude and that kind of talk. It's dangerous. Because people who are filled with the Spirit of God recognize the authority of God's Word and they're going to submit to it. They're going to obey it. In God's order of things, the source of authority is not in our own opinions. It's in the inspired Word of God. So take notice what the Word says and then submit to it. He sums it all up here in verses 39 to 40, talking again about the orderliness of spiritual gifts. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. Do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently in order. He says now, don't for forbid speaking in tongues. In other words, he says, he's talking about for this time 
In this age, there is a true gift of languages. And you see Acts 2 was a picture of that. Again, when he says tongues or languages, it's in the plural. There is the true languages. There is the true gift. Paul's not saying you should forbid this special God-given ability. But today, it's no longer really needed. So it, it wasn't forbidden then. And more importantly, they, he said, should not seek this gift, but to seek prophecy. So summing it all up. Here's the great truth again. Let all things be done, all things done, decently. That's a word that means in a seemly manner or in a right manner, that God is the God of order and harmony where everything fits together just perfectly. Paul is saying, let your service manifest God. Friends, the need for order, orderliness continues, and it must be a guiding principle here within our own church. Then. When we have that, we'll be able to grow and to learn and to be stronger and to put on the image of the likeness of our Lord Jesus. So when you come into worship service here at Brookside, I hope you see God here. I hope you see God in the beauty of the music, in the harmony of the notes and the words, and in the truth of the message as it flows in order, in order that people might be edified, that they might be built up and strengthened in their faith as we move on into a new week. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for our study this morning, and thank you that we serve the creator of the universe who put it all in order, as Jesse read for us in in the psalm today, Father, in Psalm 148. Thank you. Help us to do all things in a proper way and in an orderly way to bring clarity to your word, to glorify your name. And may our tongues confess as David did, with my whole heart have I sought you, dear Lord. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Father, we praise your name. We want to honor you this day. Thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation as we heard so beautifully shared by three young men in the baptismal service today in the waters of baptism, how they put their faith and trust in your son Jesus to save them. And oh, Father, may we be able to say it's been good to be in your house this morning. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray and all God's people say, amen. amen. Thank you so much tonight. Pastor Scott will be in Psalms, Psalm 69, I believe. So I trust you can be back. We do have Bible study classes that, that meet after. So uh, uh, take some time, fellowship, and uh, we'll have a great opportunity to be together tonight. Lord bless you.